For over 60 years, my father has traveled the world preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God loves sinners, that he's willing to forgive sin, but he's been burdened for our country and the spiral that we have caught ourselves in. You see, we're in trouble morally, politically, spiritually, economically, at every level. People want to know who can save us. God can save us, and he's wanting to save us. And the message that you're about to hear from my father is a message he believes that can not only change the direction of our nation, but it can change the direction of your life for eternity. Young Billy Graham hailed another Billy Sunday. Reverend Billy Graham one of the most inspirational spiritual leaders of the 20th century. Thank you for coming, Billy Graham. Would you welcome please evangelist, author, educator, Dr. Billy Graham. Our recipient, the man who honors us by being here today. What is your purpose? Go into the whole world and proclaim this message. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Shall make you free. Shall make you free. As I look back over my life, it's full of surprises. I never thought I would become friends with people in different countries all over the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want us to look at the cross tonight. I see how God's hand guided me. Love one another. When I began preaching many years ago, it was not with any thoughts that I'd be preaching to large audiences. God has done this. Christ is alive! Modern America today, there is a vacuum of the soul. Our country is in great need of a spiritual awakening. Well, there have been times that I've wept as I've gone from city to city and I've seen how far people have wandered from God. Of all the things that I've seen and heard, there's only one message that can change people's lives and hearts. There is a way if you come by the way of the cross. The cross. The cross. I want to tell people about the meaning of the cross. Not the cross that hangs on the wall or around someone's neck. We receive our freedom purchased by the ransom at the cross. But the real cross of Christ. The cross expresses the great love of God for man. It's scarred and blood-stained. His was a rugged cross. His real purpose for coming was to die. I know that many will react to this message, but it is the truth. And with all my heart, I want to leave you with the truth. God says, I love you. I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. That he loves you, willing to forgive you of all your sins. On our churches, we have a cross. It's embossed on our Bibles, on our Bibles. I thought the cross was a relic. It was a medallion on a necklace at best. It's an ornament that we wear around our necks, Christians and non-Christians. The cross really didn't have any meaning to me except for something artistic that rock stars wore. But talk about the depth and the real meaning of the cross, and it becomes an offense. Why is that? The cross is offensive because it confronts people. Even so, it's a confrontation that all of us must face. I was really hurting and just didn't understand the source of all my pain and, 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 and problems. I spent my whole life just burdened for something, hungering for something, thirsting after, chasing this thing that I couldn't put my finger on ultimately. I was abused by older people, some in the family, some outside of the family. So as I got older, I always talked back, I always got into fights. My whole world was surrounded by guns and drugs and gangs. I remember in front of all my friends, just telling them to watch this. And as a lady, 
uh, was driving down the street, I jumped in the middle of the street and pointed the gun right at her just to see her panic and freak out. And it was just me seeking power. My mom always told me about God. I think I had an idea that God was big and good, but as time went on and I saw more and more tragic things happen around me, I think that was the beginning of me just questioning everything about life and about God. When I was 10 years old, my stepdad came to pick me up and he said that my cousin Kelly was dead. I remember being so mad and really just just deciding that if God was big and good, why wouldn't he protect my cousin who is so tiny and so awesome, such a funny, brilliant little guy. Why wouldn't God protect him from a huge muscle guy like his stepdad who beat him to death? I look out across an audience when I stand up to preach, and I think of all the people with their different backgrounds and their various needs. And I know that they are objects of God's mighty love. To the point that he gave his son, his only son, to die upon a cross. And the cross was the most terrible form of execution by the Romans for criminals. And Jesus endured all that in our place because of our sins. We deserve the cross. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment and all that that means. I know that there are many people that dispute that. People don't want to hear that they're sinners. To many people, it's an offense. The cross is offensive because it directly confronts the evils which dominate so much of this world. You see, the Bible teaches that all of us are wrong. We've all gone astray. We've everyone turned to his own way. And when we turn to our own way, we go astray from God's way. And that includes the whole human race. And that's why the world is in such terrible danger right now. It's not dangerous so much because we have atomic bombs. It's dangerous because of the human hearts back of the bombs, filled with envy and hate and strife and greed and lust and all the other things that could pull the trigger. thinking that same year that my cousin died about the depth of the evil in the world. I never wanted to have kids. It was just a new person to suffer. That was the year I started to cry myself to sleep every night and stopped believing in God. I couldn't get away from my own depression. So I started studying other religions. There was a lot of nice ideas, but there wasn't any tangible healing. And I remember thinking, I'm tired of the pain in my heart. I'm tired of going to bed that way. I'm tired of feeling like a burden. I'm just tired of not knowing why I'm alive. And so I remember the night I laid in bed and I knew I was going to commit suicide the next day. I knew that I was not going to live past tomorrow. By 16, I was getting high on a daily basis and got involved with a woman after woman after woman. And you know, when you mix drugs, you mix alcohol, you mix youth, it's cause for an explosion. My mother was really concerned about me. I remember she just grabbed a Bible and said, I don't know what to do. 
you just need to read this Bible. You know, I remember taking the pages of the Bible and just ripping them out and throwing them on the ground and saying, I don't care about your God, I don't care about this. This isn't mean anything to me. One reason that the cross is an offense to people is because it demands, doesn't suggest, it demands a new lifestyle in all of us. Sin is a disease in the human heart. It affects the mind and the will and the emotions. Every part of our being is affected by this disease. How can we break this bondage? How can we be set free? God helps us break those chains. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Everything becomes new. He can make you a totally new person. On the day that I planned to commit suicide, I came home from school and my grandma was there and she wasn't supposed to be there. And she looked at me and said, there's something wrong with you. You're gonna go to church. I was like, no way I'm going to church. And she screamed at the top of her lungs like we were fighting back and forth and I just didn't wanna listen to her yell anymore. And so I decided, fine, I'll go. And then afterwards, I'll go ahead and follow through with my plan. So I went to the back of the church and slumped down in my chair and hated everybody in the room. And the pastor started speaking and I hated him more than anyone. And he says, there's a suicidal spirit in the room. And of course, all the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I was, well, this is really weird. <laughs> and I got up and went to the door. A white-headed man was standing there and he stopped me. And it was like, the Lord wants me to speak to you. He wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that God will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. God knows the pain in your heart. He's seen you cry yourself to sleep at night. The idea was so overwhelming to me. He's like, do you want me to pray for you so that Jesus can take the pain out of your heart? He put his hand on my shoulder and started to pray. It was as if the God of the universe showed up right in front of me. And the first thing I noticed was that God was holy and good. And the second thing I noticed was that I was so not holy and not good. I was in a really dark place. I was really lonely, really depressed. And a friend of mine reached out and invited me to a conference. And I'm thinking, why not? My mind was blown when I got there. I had never seen anything like it. I saw guys with, with bullet wounds and ex-gang members who loved Jesus, and I had never seen anything like that before. And so uh, I was intrigued. I'll never forget the pastor. You know, he started talking about Jesus and in talking about him in an intense way that I had never thought about before. I had never just imagined Jesus as a real person going through real things. I just kind of thought of him as this fairy, off distant person. But he brought it home to me and he started talking about Jesus um, being beaten and being whipped um, for a crime he didn't commit and the skin being ripped off his back and him having to in the midst of his pain, carry this cross up this mountain of a skull and being pinned to this cross. It was so vivid and visual to me. I could, I, it was like I could see this happening to Jesus. 
and I remember him saying like, how dare you tough guys call my Jesus a punk? You know, like, look at what he went through. And then the preacher said, do you not know you've been bought with the price? And it just came to a head. It was like, wow. On that cross, God was laying on Jesus our sins. They not only put nails in his hands, but before that, they scourged him. A Roman scourge was a terrible thing. They took whips and pellets on those whips and beat a person almost to death. And then they took that cross and made him carry the cross, which was in his weakened condition was almost impossible. But he carried that cross to a place outside of Jerusalem. And then they put nails in his hands. But that was not the real suffering. The real suffering is when he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, he and God, the Father, were separated. He shed his blood, and the shedding of that blood carries with it God's very life. The blood is the meeting place between God and man. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And that's what Christ was doing on the cross. He was making atonement for our sins, and he was shedding his blood. Now, when you take the blood out, that means you're giving your life. And that's what it means. It means the life of Christ. The cross and the resurrection of Christ offers forgiveness of sin, offers a whole new life, and offers you eternal life if you come to the cross by repentance and faith. Jesus literally took all of this on his own back for me. You know, I remember bowing out, just head touching the ground and saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. But one step led to another, which led to another. And, you know, I was back drinking and sleeping around with women. And the conviction that I was now feeling was so strong. And I remember driving on the highway, just thinking to myself, God, you gotta do something. Because if you don't do something, I, I might hurt myself or hurt somebody else. I don't know what's gonna happen, but just don't kill me. I get cut off by a truck and my truck just starts tipping until it flips over and starts rolling fast. The glass is coming in, the windshield cracks. I'm not wearing a seatbelt at all, so I'm kind of floating around the car. And I looked myself over. There was just a piece of glass stuck in my arm and I pulled it out, and that was it. I said, Lord, I need to get with you. I need you to change me. I need you to really make this real, and I need to stop running from you. I was genuinely trying to know him more and read my Bible and grow, and I really began to be a passionate Christ follower. But you set me free. Oh. I gave you no reason to give me new seasons, to give me new life, new breathing. Yeah. But you hung there bleeding. You died for my lies and my cheating, my lust and my greed. Lord, what is a man? I realized you don't earn righteousness, that none of us is righteous, not even one, and that our works are like filthy rags to God. Jesus lived the life I could not live and died the death I should have died. You know, that, that gets me every time just to think, man, I gained everything by putting my trust in him.
if God had looked at me and said, go away forever, he would have been right. It would have been just as. The same time I felt that, I felt him inviting me to an embrace of grace and love unconditional. It was like God was saying, I love you. I know you're tired of the way you've been living and I will make you new if you will let me. My heart was just yes, it just said yes, I, I need that, I want that, please. And that's why I woke up the next day. I just felt such a peace and a joy almost that I'd never felt before. Jesus saved my life, and on top of everything else, the life of my son and the new baby. That wouldn't be if Jesus hadn't intervened and rescued me. And the most overwhelming thing is to think that Jesus became sin, and it was my sin and it was things that I've done. The house I'm on the cross, it was things that I've done. He hung naked on a cross, bleeding in a shameful way so that I would never have to be ashamed for the things that I've done. The truth is, the truth is, there is no other way besides Christ and what he did. There is no life outside of that. There is no other way of salvation except through the cross of Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The only way to the Father, Father God, is through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, why Jesus? He's the only one that was born into this world without sin. But more than that, he was a righteous one. And when you come to him, you're clothed in his righteousness. God no longer sees your sin. He no longer sees your own heart. He sees Jesus. Now, I don't understand all about it. There are many things about the cross and about salvation that I do not understand. And I'm not told that I have to understand it all. I'm told that I'm to believe. And anybody can believe. A blind man can believe. A deaf man can believe. An old person can believe. A young person can believe. And that word believe means commit. I commit my life totally to Him. Jesus Christ from the cross says, I will save you. I will forgive you. I will change you. I'll make you a new person if you come to the cross by repentance and faith. Come to Christ. When you come to Christ, you come by the way of repentance. Repent means to change to change your way of living and turn from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ and say, I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness. And I know that you're the only one that can change me. Home went dark that violent day. The whole earth quaked at last. Three days silent in the ground This body born for heaven's crown
Bible says, in spite of our rebellion and rejection, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. And when Christ died on that cross, he became guilty of lying. He became guilty of slander. He became guilty of jealousy. He became guilty of the most filthy, dirty sins. Christ took the hell that you and I deserve. Now God said, receive him. Believe in him. Put your trust and your confidence in him, and I will forgive your sins, and I will guarantee you eternity in heaven. It's all yours, and it's all free. All you have to do is receive it. Today, I'm asking you to put your trust in Christ. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer, sentence by sentence, after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you've died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent of my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. He's alive. I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. And he's given me a song to sing. He's given me a flag to follow. I have reason for existence. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? If you just prayed that prayer, we would like to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can go to our website, and there we have the material right there, and you can look at it. But I want you to remember this. Remember that God loves you. And the Bible tells us that. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. You see, that's our hope, everlasting life with almighty God in heaven. Thank you for watching. God bless you.